Hello everyone. Today we're starting with anatomy and physiology basics. This lesson is all about understanding how the human body is organized and functions. We'll go step by step through the structural levels of the body, starting with the simplest components and working our way to the most complex systems. By the end of this session, you'll have a solid foundation to help you better understand medical terminology and patient care. Let's get started by looking at how the body is structured into different levels. Let's take a closer look at how the human body is structured. The body is organized into several levels, each one building on the previous to form a more complex system. First, we have the chemical level, the simplest level, which includes atoms and molecules essential for life, like water, proteins, and DNA. These are the building blocks of everything in the body. Next is the cellular level. Cells are the basic units of life, each with a unique structure and function. For example, muscle cells help with movement, nerve cells transmit signals, and blood cells carry oxygen. Then we have the tissue level. Tissues are groups of similar cells working together for a common function. There are four types, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Moving up, the organ level is where tissues come together to form organs like the heart, lungs, and liver each with a specific job to keep the body functioning. The system level brings multiple organs together to perform complex tasks. For example, the respiratory system works to bring oxygen into the body and remove carbon dioxide. Finally, we have the organism level, which is the complete human body. All systems work together here to maintain life and health. This organization shows how the body builds from simple to complex to ensure everything works harmoniously. Now, let's talk about surface anatomy, positional terms, and directional terminology, essential tools for describing the human body in medicine. Let's start by defining surface anatomy. It involves studying the external features of the body and their relationship to deeper structures. This is important because these external landmarks guide healthcare professionals in locating and assessing internal organs or structures during exams or procedures. Some of the key landmarks include Cranial, which pertains to the skull. This is important when examining head injuries or brain-related conditions. Thoracic, which refers to the chest area. This includes major organs like the heart and lungs. Abdominal, relating to the stomach area, which houses organs like the liver, stomach, and intestines. Pelvic, which refers to the lower abdomen and pelvis, housing organs like the bladder and reproductive structures. These landmarks serve as the basis for understanding deeper anatomical relationships. Let's talk about positional terminology, which describes how the body or its parts are positioned. This is crucial in healthcare for clear and accurate communication. First, we have the anatomical position, which is the standard reference point. Picture the body standing upright facing forward with arms at the sides and palms facing forward. This position is used universally to describe the location of structures. Next, there's the supine position, where the person lies flat on their back, facing upward. This position is commonly used during surgeries or examinations of the front of the body. Finally, we have the prone position, where the person lies flat on their stomach, facing downward. This is often used during back surgeries or procedures involving the posterior side of the body. These terms ensure precision, no matter the setting or procedure. Now, let's discuss directional terminology, which is used to describe the location of one body structure relative to another. First, we have anterior, ventral, which refers to the front of the body. For example, the chest is anterior to the spine. Next, posterior, dorsal, refers to the back of the body, like the shoulder blades being posterior to the chest. We use superior, cranial, when something is closer to the head, like the head being superior to the shoulders. Conversely, inferior, caudal, describes something closer to the feet, such as the stomach being inferior to the heart. For locations closer to the midline of the body, we use medial, like the nose being medial to the eyes. Lateral is the opposite, describing something farther from the midline, like the arms being lateral to the chest. When describing proximity to the point of attachment, we use proximal and distal. For example, the elbow is proximal to the wrist, while the fingers are distal to the wrist. These terms provide a universal language for describing body parts and movements with precision. 
Let's go over some more directional terms, which help describe the location of one structure relative to another. Superior or cranial. This means toward the head or the upper part of a structure. For example, the head is superior to the abdomen. Next is inferior, also called caudal. This refers to being away from the head or toward the lower part of a structure. The navel is inferior to the chin. Next is anterior or ventral, toward the front of the body. For instance, the breastbone is anterior to the spine. Move into the next one, posterior or dorsal, toward the back of the body. An example is the heart being posterior to the breastbone. Lastly is medial. This means closer to the midline or the body. For example, the heart is medial to the arm. These terms provide precise ways to communicate the relative positions of body parts, which is essential in medical practice. Let's go through some important directional terms that help describe the location of body parts in relation to each other. Lateral. This means away from the midline of the body. For example, the arms are lateral to the chest. Intermediate refers to being between a more medial and a more lateral structure. For instance, the collarbone is intermediate between the breastbone and the shoulder. Proximal, closer to the point of attachment or origin. For example, the elbow is proximal to the wrist. Distal, the opposite of proximal, meaning farther from the original point of attachment. The knee is distal to the thigh. Superficial, external, toward or at the body surface. For instance, the skin is superficial to the skeletal muscles. Deep, internal, away from the body surface or more internal. For example, the lungs are deep to the skin. Understanding these terms allows us to communicate precise locations of structures and movements in medical contexts. Now, let's review body cavities, abdominopelvic quadrants, and body planes. Now let's talk about body cavities which are spaces within the body that house and protect our internal organs. Dorsal cavity is located along the back of the body. It has two main parts, the cranial cavity, which protects the brain, and the spinal cavity, which houses the spinal cord. Ventral cavity is located along the front of the body. It includes the thoracic cavity, which houses the heart and lungs, and the abdominopelvic cavity, which contains digestive organs, reproductive organs, and other structures. Body cavities play a vital role in protecting our internal organs and providing them with space to function properly. Understanding these cavities helps us better locate and describe the position of organs in medical practice. Let's focus on the abdominopelvic area, which is divided into four quadrants. These divisions help us locate and identify organs more accurately in medical settings. Right upper quadrant or RUQ, this quadrant contains the liver, gallbladder, parts of the pancreas, and parts of the small and large intestines. It's a critical area to evaluate for conditions like gallstones or liver disorders. Left upper quadrant, or LUCU. This quadrant holds the stomach, spleen, part of the pancreas, and parts of the small and large intestines. Pain here might indicate issues like gastritis or splenic injury. Right lower quadrant, or RLQ, this contains parts of the small and large intestines, the right ovary, right fallopian tube, appendix, and right ureter. This is the area we evaluate for appendicitis. Left lower quadrant, or LNLQ. This includes parts of the small and large intestines, the left ovary, left fallopian tube, and left ureter. Conditions like diverticulitis or ovarian issues are often associated with this area. Dividing the abdominopelvic area into quadrants ensures precision when identifying symptoms, diagnosing, or planning treatments. Next, let's talk about body planes, which are imaginary lines used to divide the body into sections. These planes help us describe locations and movements in a standardized way. Sagittal plane. This plane divides the body into right and left parts. If the division creates equal halves, it's called the mid-sagittal plane. For example, when performing imaging or describing a movement like a bicep curl, this plane is important. Coronal or frontal plane. This divides the body into anterior or front and posterior or back parts. Think about movements like side lunges which occur along this plane. Transverse or horizontal plane. This plane divides the body into superior or upper and inferior or lower parts. It's commonly used in CT scans 
and to describe rotational movements like twisting the torso. These planes provide a universal way to communicate body structure and function, especially in medical imaging and physical assessments. Let's review acid-base balance in the human body. Let's dive into acid-base balance, which refers to the body's ability to maintain equilibrium between acidic and basic or alkaline compounds. This balance is essential for keeping all our bodily functions running smoothly. The pH scale is what we use to measure acidity or alkalinity. It ranges from 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. Anything below 7 is acidic, while anything above 7 is alkaline. For the human body, maintaining the right blood pH is vital. The normal pH range for blood is 7.35 to 7.4, 5 comma, which is slightly alkaline. Even small deviations from this range can disrupt bodily functions, so the body has several tightly regulated mechanisms to keep this balance in check. We will later explore how systems like the respiratory and renal systems play a role in maintaining this balance. Now, let's explore the mechanisms that regulate acid-base balance in the body. These systems work together to keep the blood pH within the normal range of 7.3, 5 to 7.4, 5. Buffer systems are the body's first line of defense. These chemical buffers, such as bicarbonate and phosphate, act quickly to neutralize excess acids or bases in the blood. The respiratory system plays a key role by regulating the levels of carbon dioxide, or CO2, in the blood. When we breathe faster, we expel more CO2, which reduces acidity. On the other hand, slower breathing retains CO2, making the blood more acidic. The renal system, or the kidneys, offers a longer-term solution. The kidneys maintain balance by excreting excess acids or bases in the urine. This process takes more time, but is highly effective in stabilizing pH levels. These systems work together seamlessly to maintain the delicate balance necessary for our body's normal functioning. Let's now discuss acid-base imbalances, which occur when the blood pH goes outside its normal range of 7.35 to 7.45. Acidosis happens when the blood pH falls below 7.3, 5 comma, indicating an excess of acids in the body. This can be caused by two factors. Respiratory acidosis, which results from CO2 retention due to slow or shallow breathing, and metabolic acidosis, caused by excessive production of metabolic acids or loss of bicarbonate, such as in conditions like diarrhea or kidney failure. Alkalosis, on the other hand, occurs when the blood pH rises above 7.45, indicating an excess of bases. Similar to acidosis, there are two forms, respiratory alkalosis, which results from hyperventilation and excessive CO2 loss, and metabolic alkalosis, which is caused by a loss of acids or an increase in bicarbonate, such as from prolonged vomiting or certain medications. Understanding these imbalances helps us identify the underlying causes and tailor treatments appropriately. The first session of anatomy and physiology is complete. Thank you for your time and participation. There are two more videos for you to watch. See you in the next video.